everyone. So excited for our discussion today. We are going to be responding and talking about our conversation with Yuval Harari. So if you have not listened to our Yuval Harari episode from last week, go listen to that first. That will make this make a lot more sense. And here we go. Hey, Reed, it is great to be with you here today. Always great to be here. There's obviously a lot of agreement uh, between you and Yuval about how you see the world, about your care for humanity. You want to make sure to be shooting in the right direction. But there was also plenty of disagreement, sort of both philosophical and also like what exactly is going to happen. So I'd love to hear your reflections. Tell me about the conversation and where did you where did you disagree? Well, Yuval, obviously, um, always an amazing delight to talk to and one of the uh, leading um, public intellectuals of our time and a very clear-headed thinker. I mean, part of what he tries to do is say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the world as clearly and without uh, illusion or self-delusion as possible, and I report what I see. For him, he looks at the, um, you know, the kind of the exponential uh, or the ex- ex- massive acceleration, I'm not even sure, it, like the word exponential is frequently overused in this context, of increase in capability. And uh, and he goes, well, it's it, it's going to be a new species. We don't know what the new species is. We know that we is as is, is homo sapiens, when we were a new species, we remade the planet. Why shouldn't we just infer that it's going to remake the planet? And, you know, boy, I hope there's there's a role for me, you know, kind of um, uh, continuing to, you know, be a meditative kind of human being in this in this mixture. And, um, you know, I think that it's actually, in fact, going to, um, you know, remake lots of things and remake industries, cognitive industrial revolution, going to remake um, where you know, kind of what the uh, future of human activity is. And I think it's a much higher probability that this elongates the kind of the robustness, the capabilities of Homo sapiens. It's kind of like saying, you know, again, in a simple metaphorical sense, you know, is it is is it more likely to be creating, um, you know, kind of drug resistant uh, or sorry, uh, new forms of of antibiotics that will help against drug resistant tuberculosis, or is it more likely to be creating the tuberculosis? And I think it's more likely to be creating the, the therapeutics uh, to, to, to tuberculosis. So it's kind of, um, so there's a kind of a probability set. Now, then when you get into kind of details, he says, well, but one of the problems is it's a learning machine. And if you're learning from, um, you know, kind of human beings, um, look at all this bad stuff we do. You know, look, we're we're cruel. Um, you know, we torture people. We engage in war. We're lying and self-deceptive, and you know, da 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 da. And isn't just gonna just like a child of ours isn't just gonna learn? You know, because it isn't just what we say. It like watches what we do. And you know, I think obviously there is you know kind of definitely some truth to that. But also, by the way, um, just as when we teaching, we're, we're teaching children ourselves, uh, even though we have some faults, we actually try to direct you know, children towards our more aspirational selves, the fact that we're compassionate, the fact that we're wise, the fact that we have these kind of uh, humanism values, these humanity values, it's kind of, you know, kind of what's in depth encoded in religions um, and where religions kind of share a context of you know, how do you, um, you know, aspire to being our better selves? And, um, and you know, that, you know, I, and this is the half full and half empty. I go, well, actually, in fact, I think we can shape it that way. I think we do that with our children as it is. It's part of what we try to make progress in society. And I think that's the, the thing that we can potentially drive to. But I also think to your point, a lot of it, of course, is is optimism and is let's figure out not to complain. Let's figure out actually action so we can get to a better place. But some of it is just recognition of some of the bad things that actually can happen. Like you said, sort of the tuberculosis versus the antibiotics for tuberculosis. The same people often who are gloomers or saying this is going down a bad route 
would probably also tell you that climate change is going to do irreparable harm or is going to say that we're unprepared for the next pandemic. And so you're not just saying that, you know, AI is great compared to some utopia. You're saying AI is great compared to the world we have now because we have real challenges and AI like has to be here to help solve them. So a lot of people are concerned. It's like, oh, you have these five AI labs who are just, you know, they're deciding the future of the world. Like, first of all, how do we make sure that they have the right values? Like, is there anything we can do to affect what they're doing? And then also, like, who else needs to be involved in this? Like, who else needs to be a part of this decision making? Well, a couple things. One is, um, you know, and this causes existential risk people some heartburn. It's probably five labs heading to 15, heading to 30, um, or at least 10 to 15 at minimum. And why is that good? For people who get heartburn, why do you think that's actually a great outcome for the AI space? Well, it's a complicating uh, outcome for the AI space. One of the places where I tend to find, you know, kind of, um, many critics to be kind of, you know, really yelling about like, well, I should be in charge and it should be me. And it's like, well, not clear, right? Even though you go, well, I don't want just the large tech companies and just the heads of these labs to be in charge. And you're like, well, but some people will be like, there will be a limit, like take, there will be a limited set of people who will be in charge. And then you go, given that limited set, what's the, what's the, the reasonability of which limited set. And it's like, well, you know, folks who are, you know, kind of uh, investing and building this stuff and have the capabilities of doing it and, and are, are putting their own lives, missions and their economics into this and who are held accountable by various networks of accountability, which includes critics, includes press, includes government, includes customers, includes shareholders, includes, you know, family and, and you know, community members, includes teammates, you know, there's, there's, there's many, many different things. And we try to make those channels of accountability to be as healthy and as inclusive as possible. Like the people who say, it's only these five and what gives them the right? It's like, well, actually, in fact, it's <laughs> it's a growing number. So if, you're, if your particular thing is, is that, you know, what do we, what do we think about these five? You know, it's like, well, but it's not only going to be these five. And a little bit of that is a kind of the gesture of the people who get on the you know, kind of blindly or for their own self, their own, their own reason, they get on the antitrust horse. Um, and so they tend to go, our really important thing is to limit these five. And it's like, well, it's only really important to limit these five. If you think these are only these, these are the, 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 the laws of physics say it's only these five. And it's actually not the case because, you know, since, um, since I've been doing the kind of Western democracy, Things both there have been new uh, entrants on the Western democracy side, and there's at least three to five that we're tracking in China, and it's probably actually, in fact, you know, ten to twenty in China. So you've got, you know, this 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 swarm of it. So you get a larger number of people. So in as much as it's people um, with different points of view, you know, kind of uh, playing for this. That answers the, or that that gestures at the, you know, that there's a number of people working on this. Now, this is not this a monopoly other, question. Yes, yeah. not a monopoly question. But this gives other people heartburn because they go, well, actually, in fact, these 10 to 20 people are going to compete that as opposed to getting to our highest virtue selves, it'll be because of competition and mm. because of divergence between people. We're going to have all we like, you know, for example, we'll have AI weapons created and, and why won't someone, you know, either deliberately or accidentally of this much larger set, you know, you know, be targeting, creating kind of the equivalent of the Terminator. So, you know, I think that the question is, again, is to say, look, if we presume that, that we're kind of, we, the, the, the fundamental thing about human beings is we divide into groups, we have different perspectives about what the risks are, but what the important things to achieve are, and we compete with each other, and part of our competition is is manifesting those values, the thing that we must do as thoughtful human beings who are trying to be um, you know, great for humanity is we say, all right, how do we help those efforts that um, you know, care about the same kind of you know, perspective of 
you know, called being compassionate towards human beings, of being, you know, kind of elevating our better selves, of having a human future that that is that is the continued evolution that we've had over centuries and and millennia, um, you know, and a very broad brush to continue to do that, to be, um, you know, kind of, you know, the virtues of kind of wisdom and empathy and, and, and other kinds of things. And how do we, how do we do that? And the answer is make those, those, those projects that uh, are deeply trying to in, uh, embed those values, embed the values in what they're in, in the AI systems they're creating in the products that they're deploying and to make those, you know, kind of the more accelerated, you know, efforts. Um, mm-hmm. And as you know, that's, of course, what, I, what I've been doing. Look, there is a possibility that we're creating creatures, we're creating new entities, and, and it's mind-bending. But it doesn't mean it's a certainty. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that the way that we should steer is, is, well, because that's a possibility, we should steer about that being the certainty. We actually have to be iterating and seeing, because it's completely possible that you know, X years from now, we'll say, oh, just like when in the '80s we were talking about this with AI, and yes, this is a much better technology. Yes, it's 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 achieved so much more. Yes, it's on a better curve. But just when we we're talking about that, and we said, okay, like that will completely change. It's like we may very easily discover in as as few as a few years, and maybe even five to ten. It's like, well, actually, in fact, these aren't really entities. They're actually tools in the following way, and they have the following shape, and this is the way we're inter- integrated in. And so, it's a it's a discovery of of what's possible because not everything is possible at every moment. And another thing I appreciated about the conversation, and this is probably true of any conversation where you and Yuval are in the same room, uh, is that we get to talk about more more philosophy, more philosophical questions about sort of what it means to be human. And you know, he he had an argument that was focused on the critical distinction between intelligence and consciousness. And he said that while AI might become vastly more intelligent than humans, intelligence alone doesn't guarantee a pursuit of truth or even the capacity to reject falsehood. And I know truth seeking is something you talk about a lot. It's like, how do we get to this place? How do we teach truth seeking behavior? What are the ways that we can model that world? And so I'll ask you, is consciousness a necessary foundation for this truth seeking? And if so, can this non-conscious AI like ever really be truly aligned with our deepest values or are we missing something fundamental with asking them to define truth when they don't have the consciousness piece, or at least not yet? You know, I haven't had a chance to have this conversation with Yuval. So if Yuval is listening to this, this is the next move in the conversation. Is um, I, What I've realized is I think where it's helpful to think about is, well, what kinds of truth seeking are necessary from from conscious entities and how does that illuminate what we think about consciousness and what kinds of truth seeking are doable without consciousness with just mm-hmm. intelligence or fitness functions because you clearly have a set of truth functions that are where consciousness is not necessary like it it just like for example you can you can train in in you know lots of different systems even you know less sophisticated than ai systems to actually in fact you know run a truth seeking process um, I mean, you know, heck, when we have uh, deep research in, you know, ChatGPT and Copilot and Gemini and other and Claude and others, it it actually says go, go cross check your work, right? Like right. go pull out documents and cross check mm-hmm. your thing, and then when two things disagree, go look for other information and and privilege these kinds of sources of information. Just the same kind of cross checking we do in our group dis- truth seeking, whether it's science or or you know, judicial processes, or you know, kind of academic work, or everything else. It's kind of that process for journalism to to kind of do truth seeking. Clearly, you can do a lot of that with just intelligence. So then you get to this interesting question around, um, you know, like obviously, if you had an enlightened being that said, "I am in touch with how difficult suffering is." And I view the importance is to kind of reduce suffering across, you know, um, uh, more things other than just me and to have kind of quality kind of sentient life is doing that. 
then that's a very good thing. Is consciousness necessary for some component of that thing? Is the fact that we experience reflection, meditation, potential empathy, compassion, sympathy with each other through the recognition of that consciousness, is that an essential component? And if that's an essential component, can we keep it essential in various ways for how we operate what the future of the world is? And I think that that's... Um, uh, that's a research that that's a that's an ongoing discovery question as we as we get there and I'm still thinking about it. Now I would say in kind of a final close this is we clearly um can demonstrate better and better alignment with human values. Like one of the things that again if I were to make the argument out of evidence for optimism versus just a I'm hoping for the best is when you look at kind of the evolution of the open AI systems of GPT-2 and 3 and 4 and 4.5, they've much, um, as they get more sophisticated, they much more naturally and easily align with a set of human considerations. Um, they much more naturally understand, you know, kind of <coughs> what potentially our better selves are, what those things are. And they actually do actually, in fact, show better ability to go mm -hmm. like I have some level of understanding comprehension of of what the kind of human goal set is in the aspirational side I've been I've learned and been trained to preference like oh you're trying to figure out how to write poetry or you're trying to figure out how to how to have a, a productive conversation with your friend your child your spouse you know and I can help with that and then when you say, "Hey, I'd like to you you know to um, make um, a bomb," it says, "No, I'm not going to help you with that." Right. <laughs> right. Right. And it naturally, you know, kind of ha uh, aligns better in those ways. Doesn't mean there's a ton of work. Doesn't mean there isn't risk. But that's that's sure. like a positive, where we're getting that alignment. Even though I think it's, um, I think it's only the you know kind of the very extreme crazy fringe that think these systems are conscious today. Right. And there are people who think that they are conscious today. Yep. I think there's a whole bunch of good arguments as to why they're not. But, uh, and will they ever be? That's one more mind-bending question. Well, I cannot wait for our next conversation uh, with Yuval to tease into a lot more of these ideas. Reed, thank you so much. Likewise. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network. It's hosted by Arya Finger and me, Reed Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Katie Sanders, Edie Allard, Sarah Schleed, Vanessa Handy, Aliyah Yates, Paloma Moreno Jimenez, and Malia Agudelo. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sapieva, Vanasi Dilos, Ian Alice, Greg Viado, Parth Patil, and Ben Rellis.